I would encourage you to grab it. We're going to go to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. I told you last week, we're just going to kind of look at some of Paul's uh, final words to his boy Timothy. And I want to continue going through some of this today, if I can. Okay, or if you have an actual Bible, keep flipping, all right? I, I want to just kind of pull out this, because this seemed to me like Paul was just not introducing anything new not telling him any kind of instruction. It was as if like Timothy or, or Paul here in his final days is just looking back at his number one. Like Timothy was his boy. Knowing what's like, let me just remind you something, Timothy. Let me just remind you about everything I've been talking about. In this cold, dark cell, Paul is writing his final letter, these final words of the incredible apostle Paul. And he picks his boy Timothy to write these letters. If you remember Timothy, where he's at, he's in Ephesus. In context, you know, you think of like crazy things that happens. You could think that of Ephesus also. Weird temple, crazy things happening in the temple. If you were to put a billboard up on your way to Ephesus, it may read, what happens in Ephesus stays in Ephesus. You, you could probably think that Timothy here in Ephesus, with all this darkness and wickedness, you could almost hear this sense of discouragement that Paul is addressing to his boy, Timothy. I've given you enough time. Let's, let's read it. You then, my child... Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete... Is not crowned unless he completes, competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure with everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Would you just join me and let's just pray over the reading of God's word this morning. Father, I thank you, Lord, so much for your word. For in it, it sharpens us. In it, we have life. In it, we are sanctified by it. So many of us have been looking for you to speak, God. I thank you that your word just exploded right here in front of our face. God, when we leave out of this room, may we remember Jesus Christ and not some random dude yelling. In Jesus' name, amen. I love this section and this portion of Scripture. I love how Paul starts out... And how he's really just kind of passing on some important information to Timothy. And I believe that this is just as applicable to us today as it was for his young protege, Timothy, when he says, My child! Man, could you imagine, like, your hero, or, or like, whomever, like, you love, or, or whomever, like, your choice of poison is that you listen to, I hope it's Matthew, or whatever it is, like, could you imagine that person, like, writing you a personalized letter and say, my child, 
Like of all people, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and he says like, man, you're my child. You're my spiritual child. I love that what he says, be strengthened. And he says so many times throughout his letter, like be strengthened, be strong. Why? And I, and I just wonder, could it be that, Paul, that, that Timothy may just be feeling a little discouragement? Maybe this, this urban area is just kind of getting to him. Like, I can identify with that in ministry. Ministry sometimes can just be that, just be discouraging. Like, God, why won't anybody get it? Why won't anybody just listen to what I'm flipping saying? Like, people will come up to us, and they'll ask for counsel, and they'll ask for advice, and I'll give it to them, man. I'm like, yes, they got it. And then, like, you read on their social media how they did the complete opposite of what you told them. I'm like, do you not have ears? What's wrong with you? And it's discouraging, so I feel this. I feel why Paul has to exhort him into this, be strong, be strengthened. And he's passing this baton. He's telling Timothy these final words. He's like, like, like giving him like some new revelation. Like if that's what you were looking for when you came in this morning, I'm sorry. I just want to just remind you of something, if that's okay. As Paul is reminding his boy Timothy here. Paul says, like, you've got to take this gospel. If you, this is reminiscence of what we talked about last week. Like, like, guard the deposit. Like, take that message of the gospel and not just keep it for yourself, but like you're proclaiming it out to everyone. And, and so look what Paul's doing again. Take that, guard that gospel, and trust it with other men and women who can also take it out. What does it take to continue the message of the gospel Paul's like, man, you, Timothy, I'm passing it on to you, and you've also got to pass it on to others. I just want to answer a question, like, like, what does it take, what does it look like to pass on the message to the next generation, to pass on this baton of faith? Look what verse 3 says. Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him to us. Like, I went all Baptist on you guys. I've got three points and then two sub points after that. My first point is this. Realize that you're in a battle. Timothy, share in the suffering as a good soldier would. Don't forget that this that you're involved with is a battle. Like, do you know how you can get uh, defeated in the Christian life? You forget that you're in a battle. I'll give you the keys to closing down the door of this church and any church that you are ever a part of in your life. You want to know how you can shut down a church or a movement of God? Forget that you're in a battle. That's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. The enemy wants you to forget that this what you're a part of is a battle. And just pretend that it's just some easy um, coastal living lifestyle. God would never require you to fight. This is how the enemy wins. Like, could you imagine a soldier? I, I, I was never enlisted in the army, but, but I know we have veterans here, and, and I, I know a little bit about it to, to know that if a general told a soldier, go do this, and if, so let's just say, go do this means go get the enemy. And if the soldier said, you know what, I actually just signed up because the recruiter said they were going to pay for my college. And so I just don't get, I just don't feel like getting fired at today. What would that general do to that soldier? Matt, what would that general do to that? It would be over. Never forget that you're in a battle. So, so let me kind of 
peel this apart a little bit, which leads me to this. Don't fall for the enemy's schemes. Look what he says here. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So that soldier's aim is to please the general, the commanding officer. Church, our goal is to please Jesus Christ, our commanding officer. And so we cannot get caught up in the weeds. We can't allow that the schemes of the enemy to derail us from this idea that we're in a fight, y'all. Don't fall for the enemy's schemes. This is, um, this is definitely Pauline language here. If you remember in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, when he says, Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the what? The, the armor of God so that you can withstand the schemes of the enemy. And the schemes of the enemy aren't just big things. Like some of you are like, look, I got this whole schemes of the enemy thing. I know, don't do drugs, don't do prostitution. I got it. But that's not just the schemes of the enemy. Sometimes the schemes of the enemy are tiny things that will lead you and will lure you. The, the Puritan Thomas Brooks in the 17th century and his precious remedies of Satan devices gives us a lot of key points in how we are to handle the schemes of the enemy and Satan's tactics. And I want to read a few of these to you. And I've modernized the language a little bit because sometimes 17th century writings are just a little bit hard to understand if you're like me and you got like a valley education. Unless, whatever, you may understand it completely. What are these schemes that he sometimes uses? One of the schemes that he uses is sometimes he just shows you the bait, but he hides the hook. The scheme is that he'll paint sin with virtue's color. Because sin in its own nature is disgusting and vile, but Satan will polish the turd, if I could use a crass analogy, and make you think that you're getting a fillet, but you're not. By getting you to realize sin as virtue. In other words, I'm not nosy, I'm just concerned. How can I pray for you? Because I'm concerned. And like you just use it for gossip. Nobody in here does that. I'm not greedy. I'm just thrifty. I'm just building my own empire. By overstressing the mercy of God. Oh, come on now, that's me. Like I'll, I'll sin. Thank God, though, it's okay because it's going to be covered. Like, like I'll, I'll, can I be real with you all this morning as if you have no other expectation? Like, I'll flip somebody off and cuss them out if they pull out in front of me. But you know what? Thank God for his mercy, and I'll just use that as my excuse. The key takeaway there is just don't pull out in front of me, right? That's funny. Another thing, he'll, he'll, he makes us bitter over suffering. I'll get into that in just a second. By showing Christians how many bad people seem to have a great life, but by getting you to compare one part of your life to another part of your life, like I could keep going on and on and on. With, these are tiny little things that the enemy will use. Sometimes he doesn't use the large, extravagant sins. Sometimes he just tries to, to bait you, and that's all you'll ever see. And before you know it, you've been hooked and you didn't even know it. Look, listen, listen to this. This is important because, because he gives us the importance of this is because we follow a different set of commands. And he's going to lay this out for us uh, about the, the commands that we are to follow. Like, like here, here's the reality. You're following either two sets of commands, either your own commands or God's commands. There is no middle of the road. That's your life. 
Look how he, he, he tells him, he says, man, I'm not instructing you in anything. Like, I'm just reminding you of this. And then he goes into this, like, if the, if the analogy of the soldier didn't get through your brain, he uses a second analogy, sports, an athlete. Look what he says. So he, he gives us, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Like imagine if you're a runner in the Olympics. You've got like all these people lined up behind you. And imagine they say, go! And everybody runs, but you don't. You just take a hard left and you cross the finish line. Boom! I beat all you jokers! No, you cheated! It's not up to you to define the rules. God defines them for us. It's not according to your standard. It's not according to how you want to live your life so comfortably. It's according to the rules and the laws and the commands of God. God has given us a way of life. Then he says, all right, all right, all right, Timothy. If you didn't catch the soldier analogy, or if you're a musician and have no idea what an athlete does, like I was kind of a little ticked off. Why didn't you use an, a musician analogy, Paul? Huh? I'll talk to him about it later. What about the farmer in the dale? Verse 6. I thought that was funny, but that's all right. You'll catch it later. Look at the verse. So it is the hard working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crop. So he's like, listen, okay, Timothy, soldier, you're going to fight, athlete, don't cheat, keep going, follow the commands of God. Now listen, if there's not a more frustrating person on the planet, it's probably a farmer. They've got to put in all of the hard work. And guess what? They don't even get to determine when the harvest comes. In fact, they can put in all of the hard work. They can plow and plow and plow and sow and sow and sow. They can water, water, water and repeat. And some natural disaster comes, sweeps all of their works. And guess who doesn't get to see the harvest? The farmer. Like sometimes the Christian life is like that. We shouldn't expect any difference. We shouldn't expect anything different. You are a farmer. Your job is to plow. Your job is to sow. Your job is to water and trust God for the harvest. Like imagine with me, like, like if you're in a neighborhood, you live in a neighborhood, you don't live out in the farm somewhere, and just like some random dude with overall straw hat and a tractor just comes riding by. And you stop him, you're like, bro, what are you doing? And he just tells you, he's like, I'm looking for the harvest, man. Because you know all farmers, they talk like redneck. Man, I'm just looking for the harvest, bro. And you're like, well, did you, like I'm not a farmer, but I know a little bit about it. I know a little bit about planting things, but... Shouldn't you not be looking on the asphalt for the harvest and go, like, looking out in the fields? Like, I'm no rocket scientist, but I think that's how it works. Like, just because you dress the part of a farmer doesn't mean you're a farmer. And I just wonder if I can just kick us in the shins a little bit this morning. How many of you, we, we, we want to do that? We just, I'll just check it on my list. I went to church. That makes me a Christian. Farming is a hard job, and that's your work. You plow, you plow. Paul is like, he's, he's writing, and he's got Timothy on his mind. Like, Timothy, now's the time to get your butt to work. Ain't no time to just be sitting by in your little hut don't be fearful. Be strengthened by the grace of God to become this soldier that you're in a fight, Timothy. 
Timothy, you're in a race. And you've got to go by the standards of this message of the gospel. Timothy, you are a farmer. You continue the work. Even though when you don't get results, you keep plowing. You keep fighting. You keep running, Timothy. I love this, and he says in verse 8, And remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Like, I love that. Like, again, Paul's not giving him any kind of, like, deep revelation or no, nothing new. He's just like, and, and if all else fails, Timothy, remember Jesus. First things first. Remember why we are here. This is of first importance, Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ. Refuge. Remember Jesus Christ. It's not about like any style or preferences. It's Jesus Christ. When you're wondering like, why are we here? What are we doing? It's Jesus when, you, when you're reminded that there's still a harvest to gather, when you're reminded that there still are fields to be plowed, why are you doing it? Remember, Timothy. Remember, church. Timothy. Remember, Jesus. For which I'm suffering, Paul says, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Paul apparently is a reformed preacher, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in the Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we also live with him. If we endure with him, we also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. I just want to leave with just a couple of thoughts, particularly from this last portion here. Eternity is absolutely worth the suffering and the sacrifice. It's like the, the Western church model has told us we should not expect any kind of suffering. We should not expect any kind of hardship. Like, Christian life is the easy life. Hashtag the blessed life. I don't know what all you're going through. I know some of you are going through some, some issues. But, but hear the, the words of Pastor Paul. The suffering that you're going through, it's worth it. It's worth it because eternity with Christ We'll look back one day with whatever suffering that you've ever gone through and one day you'll be in the kingdom of God like with Christ ruling and reigning with him and you'll, you'll think back like all that was nothing compared to what we have with Jesus Christ in eternity. He says, Timothy, remember like if you died with Christ, like you'll live with him Paul, this, is, this is real for Paul because Paul is about to be like, I mean, this is it for Paul. He's about to be martyred for the name of Jesus. Endure, he says. And I want to go back to that verse one because I think this other thing that we need to be reminded of is it's very, very crucial to us that our strength is from whose we are it's not about who you are. Like, look what verse 1 says. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. This is the idea of gaining strength, not by you conditioning yourself or not by any works that you can do. This is the idea here in, in the Greek that you are conditioned by someone else. That the strength is not going to come from you, but the strength is going to come from Someone who is an outside agent that we know of is Jesus Christ. 
How will we endure? How will we continue? How will we grow this church? How will we continue to reach out? When we're feeling fatigued, when we're feeling like, is it even worth it? Like when we're feeling like, like there's even no significance to my life. How do we continue to go out? It's not going to be by anything you do. It's going to be by the grace that Christ strengthens you with. That's where we find our strength. It's not by being conditioned in our own works. Paul, if you recall the, the previous chapter, he says, look, it's not by, not by your power or strength, but by the Spirit of God. It's by the power of God that flows through you. Like, how will we continue by the strength of the grace of God. Like, I have two more weeks in person with you. And I just wanted to just take my time over the next couple weeks, just not to give you anything like new. Nothing, nothing of angels from heaven singing over us with some heavenly message. I just want to remind you that you're in a battle. You're, you're in a battle with or without me. I mean, I'll be in the same battle with you just 2,000 miles away. My battle is going to be different, but it's still the same. My battle is going to look a lot different. I'll be, we'll be battling another ideal, but you're also battling here the, the consumer Christianity to where there's a church around every corner. And I just want to remind you of that, that this, this battle is real. That you have land to plow. That you are in a race. Finish well. Amen. Don't take the shortcuts. Don't just stop. Amen. Like when you don't see me up here preaching, it's not a time for you just to stop. And you, because i got to remind you, it's about Jesus. It was never about me. You have to continue to fight. You have to continue to run the race. Because this area needs refuge point. It needs you to continue to plow, to continue to sow, to continue to water. And even if you get wrecked by a pandemic again, even if you get wrecked by something devastating, you don't stop. I just want to remind you of that. That what you are a part of here is more... It's more about the kingdom of God and less about one individual. And you're fighting for the gospel in this area, for the truth of the gospel. And when you're discouraged, and when you just feel like, I just can't go back. I can't take Judson. It gets on my nerves. When is... <laughs> So now you know how the whole church feels about you, Judson, right? Or like when Keith is up here, or John, you're like, John, stick with singing, boy. You know, that's like when your preferences are getting involved, and I just want to re remind you, it's not about a personality, it's about Jesus Christ. And whoever comes to pastor, whoever comes to speak to you, just Remember, it's about something far greater than what you're looking at. It's, it's about Jesus Christ, and I want to urge you, don't get caught up in these weeds. Don't get caught up in the preferences. Remember, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, the one who had been promised hundreds of years ago remember Jesus and it was first things first for refuge 